I would say that out of all the chapters, this is definitely the chapter that's a little bit more difficult to teach. And um, it's also very engaging at the same time because it's such a real problem that we have as a society. I mean, a lot of the topics that we talk about are problematic issues that likely, just given the data, uh, maybe some of you might have experienced or have known people who have experienced. So just a heads up that, you know, that we are going to be talking about some sensitive topics that can be triggering uh, for some individuals. So before we get started, we need some definitions. So in terms of defining aggression, we define it as a behavior that is intended to cause psychological or physical harm to another person or an animal. We then distinguish it of whether it is physical or verbal. In this case, physical is going to be an act that causes pain or an injury um, or physical harm, where verbal is just a communication of intended harm to another person. You could also call emotional harm as verbal aggression. Harm is also comes with kind of some repercussions or some leftover fears and such, so it's a little bit more than verbal aggression. The key to these types of aggression is definitely intent. There's also two types of aggression that I think are very important to distinguish as when we look at research and the prevalence uh, of aggression across the, the various genders or individuals or dyads or groups, the type of aggression definitely is one of the moderators. So in this case, direct aggression is basically when you're just directly kind of addressing the other person or group. Indirect aggression is, is also called relational aggression. So this is kind of a type of aggression that is intended to harm a person through relationships or status. So this is kind of more of that psychological flavor. And again, we talk about these two types of aggressions because one of the things that we do know is that, at least in the woman-man binary approach to looking at aggression, there are some differences in terms of who does most. Now, violence is a more severe type of physical aggression. So one thing is being aggressive to maybe pinching your little brother because he's being annoying or something like that. And then violence is when you're actually causing extreme harm and that is the goal. It is to make a person uh, feel pain to break to cause bruises. So that is the violence layer of physical aggression. So in a sense, all aggression needs to be intended. Not all aggression is physical though, but all physical aggression it does come with intent. And also not all physical aggression is violence, considered violence. It's, uh, there's a layer or a severity that may or may not have like a specific line. It might be different for individuals, groups, cultures that once it crosses this invisible line, it becomes what we consider violence. So in terms of some sex differences, there are plenty. Um, we, some of you might have seen the documentary Tough Guys. I think I assigned it as one of the options. And that one is a really great documentary that addresses just how much of violence and crimes are kind of based on men um, in our culture and around the globe. So in terms of violent crime, that is a crime that also has this physical aggression, violence layer to it. About 80% of it is done by men. And about 88% murders and manslaughter, which were done by, by men too. Any uh, reasons behind this? As, as you saw Jason Katz talk about the, the tough guy's mentality and how we raise boys to believe that this is something that they need to strive for to be dominant, to be aggressive to be violent at times, we kind of can see violence in, in our society sort of as a men's problem in a way. But again, that's violence in terms of physical aggression because that does not mean that women are not necessarily violent. There's plenty of women in jails for manslaughter and murder. Um, but overall, it's 12% is vastly different than 88%. And that's where we do see kind of this gendered lens and and partly there is there's a lot of factors that have been hypothesized to be the reason behind this including testosterone some people claim testosterone is an issue and there is research that supports that but there's also a lot of socialization that goes into play and a lot of things that we do as a culture that is sort of promoting this specifically for some groups versus others. The young male syndrome, or the young male hypothesis is another name, kind of the notion that a lot of men who kill or are killed tend to be in their 
their late teens and early 20s. So kind of at the epitome of their testosterone the need for being the alpha dog kind of psychological state too. Uh, that is a sin the, the young male hypothesis is it kind of says that there's something about that that relates to all this uneven violence and, and committing violent crimes. Girls and women are also aggressive obviously but they tend to go more towards indirect aggression. So often this looks like bashing somebody's reputation or using verbal aggression, uh, excluding a person, doing more of that kind of mean girl's taste things in order to, to harm emotionally another person. However, even though we do know that there is this difference and it seems to be still a little bit constant, um, it is not a large difference. So we're not having just women and girls uh, being indirectly aggressive or relationally aggressive to to people and boys or not, it's it's uh, once you start to examine a little bit more, there's actually a shorter difference among the sex differences. I think this is specifically true also as we move more online, where there is just more relational things happening via communication. So one thing though that is kind of important to note is that when we look at incarceration of female offenders, there are some things that do stand out. I have actually uh, worked at a Department of Corrections for for a year when I was uh, completing my degree and we also had we had a specific sort of like a pre halfway house for female offenders and one thing that was very true is that we that across the board most of these women had large histories of physical sexual abuse and mental illness substance abuse and just a lot of economic issues this was true also for the men but substantially a lot worse for the women. The, the history and the stories with a lot of these offenders were really just the saddest, worstest you could kind of think about, you know, from childhood. Uh, whereas in, for the males offenders, you could still get, you know, a couple of people who had really hard childhoods, but you also had some that just made real poor decisions that, you know, so it was, and that was a lot less likely with the female offenders. So now, one of the caveats, so, okay, so I've talked about how, like, men tend to commit the most crime and be the aggressors, and they tend to be, 88% of murderers are uh, males. But the flip side of that is that mostly their victims are actually other males, too, which is kind of interesting, because it is easy to think of males as being aggressive, being violent, um, committing crimes or doing things um, to other people. But what we forget is that often the victim is not necessarily a woman, it's usually another man. So it's usually, it's a lot more likely for the victim to be male. Now with that said, also though, when there are uh, women who go missing or who are uh, subsequently unfortunately murdered, usually about 30 to 40% of the time, it is a partner or a past partner. So there's all these kind of conflicting statistics that you kind of really need to pick apart, right? Because they all kind of present a different pie of the story. And thirdly, when we look at victimization, definitely there's a greater male victimization when we look at the intersection of race and ethnicity. So definitely greater difference for black and Latinos. So basically a black male is more likely to kill another black male, Latino male, and, and also a white male is more likely to kill another white male. In class, I usually show this TED Talk by Ashley Judd, where she basically shares some of the, the mean things that people uh, write to her. And not only do does she present the aspect of cyberbullying, but then the, the sexual part that can come across uh, for mostly women, where women are also not only uh, criticized and attacked and said, you know, very awful things, but they're also sort of objectified and almost threatened in terms of their bodies and their safety. So uh, it's kind of an interesting little 15 minute TED talk. As I mentioned, when we talk about intimate partner violence, this is basically just violence that is intended to go towards your romantic partner. It wasn't until more recently where you started to look at intimate partner violence and examine it from just a partner standpoint. Before, it was more so just reported as whether the wife was being beaten or battered. Uh, nowadays, we ha there is re research on people who might just be dating, who have been... Um, just living together for many years. So, so the research has expanded in that. And, and also there has been more research on 
individuals from the LGBT community or same-sex relationship. All right, so I want to pause a little bit with this term of sexual assault. Sexual assault is actually, the term itself, is actually a newer construct. So it wasn't necessarily a term that was used 20, 30 years ago. It came from the legal system. Sexual assault is the term that is used legally across many states and various courts. And it basically encompasses, it's kind of like an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of things. So unwanted sexual contact without consent from victim. And again, this can go from rape to um, maybe touching, molesting, sexual harassment. So the thing with this term, though, is that it's important to know where it came from. So as I said, it came from a legal system and actually from the defense side of the legal system of trying to defend people who had been accused of, of sexual assault or rape. Uh, and in reality, it was kind of used as a way to dilute things, right? Because if when we say the word sexual assault today, you do think, oh, well, it's it can be a slew of things, right? It can be, um, it can be one thing to, you know, something's very very horrific. Not saying that any of this is positive, but the problem with with our adaptation to that, I think, is that unfortunately, it kind of made people more immune to it. So on one on one end, if you're reading now, let's say a paper of somebody who was accused, and you see those words out there, it, it might be protective to readers as they just think sexual assault they were accused. Uh, but but it also is desensitizing in a way because uh, if we are reading, for example, the same story with the word rape in there, the, relation, the emotional reaction to that is a lot more profound, I think. Some of the other factors that do increase your likelihood for having aggression or sexual or physical violence are definitely impoverishment. So people who are poor, homeless, uh, especially women, tend to be at a higher risk. Sex workers are definitely another group that unfortunately has a higher rate of victimhood in terms of aggression and violence. Refugees, immigrants, and then finally women in the military. So the case of Vanessa Guillen was pretty uh, noted this summer. And the thing with the Vanessa Guillen case was that it's actually not a new phenomenon. This has been happening for many many years. It's There's a really good documentary called The Invisible War that I think was published in like 2015 or something that basically just kind of talked about that, talked about the prevalence of uh, women uh, sex being sexually assaulted in the military, whether in active duty. It's not only underreported, but it's under-persecuted, under-addressed, and how in this case there was almost even a culture of punishing the victim. Definitely a really hard documentary to watch, but The Invisible War kind of talks about this. And it's so a couple of facts about rape. It is hard to get the correct data on rape. One, there's a lot of unacknowledged rape. So people who don't necessarily believe that their experience was such. There's also a lot of rape myths. There's also a lot of people who do not report. Uh, so there are a lot of layers that allow us to have good data, but necessarily it's not the most accurate. The lack of reporting is really uh, troubling uh, because, again, when, when people have been asked about their past experiences after it's happened, you do have a higher rate of, of, of being able to report that. Then, like, for example, if we were trying to do a study on the prevalence right now, there is a large population of, of individuals who probably would not admit to it just for their own protection, whether it's psychological, whether it's denial. Uh, but there's there's fears for the police, there's fears for not having proof, there's fears for how there's, their family's going to think about them. There's just a lot of issues. There's also fears for retaliation, especially as your book talks about a lot. Most of the rapes out there are not kind of the person who snuck out of the woods and you never seen before. Uh, it's usually an acquaintance or somebody who has been around. There's established relationships, which makes it even harder for victims to move forward and actually report the, the happenings. The One of the options for this week is for you to see the video called I Am Evidence, and it basically talks about not just this, but even when it does get reported, there is a, unfortunately an embarrassing and troubling backlog of many cases that have not been addressed. 
And this is, as the documentary talks about, it's not a one state issue, but it's really a national issue. Uh, being a therapist myself, um, unfortunately, I have seen this too many times, uh, just even even the way that, that victims get interrogated or when they get followed up, there's a lot of victim blaming. There's a lot of, well, do you sh are you sure you want to keep on reporting this? Or do you want to stop cases? So there's a lot of kind of, there's a culture of trying to deter people from reporting. That again is very troubling because when we look at the numbers of people who report, those are terrible, but also, and then this culture of victim blaming, again, that still infiltrates not only our culture in general, but it infiltrates our system. So the people who are maybe part of the police or part of the, uh, the certain departments that address that. A lot of times, again, it's uh, victims are aware of that. They are aware of how other victims have been talked about. They are aware about the experiences of other people in their life who went through it and maybe did not get resolved or it became more of a burden than an actual um, justice was served kind of thing. So, so definitely that is something I think that we struggle with as a society. All right, so there are many other theories that I definitely need you to look at. So for example, the, the role of power, socioeconomic factors, honor cultures, honor killings, definitely look at what honor killings are. Uh, some of the other perspectives, like the socioeconomic dependence perspective, status and consistency perspective, which all try to explain why we see these differences of, uh, of uh, rape and sexual violence. So do review those, but I'm going to finish with uh, explaining the testosterone exp explanation. Uh, one, because it's very interesting, and, and also, again, because uh, at face value, it's going to look like it's a completely biological uh, explanation. But as I've talked about before in our bio biology and our social fa uh, cultural factors chapter, you cannot divorce biology by, from culture because both of those things interact, right? So this is why the question of nature versus nurture really can't be answered because nature happens, nurture and nature happen at the same time, right? They are always impacting each other. And the notion that one impacts the other more in most of our behavioral sciences is frankly just hard to distinguish because we can't live in lab lives in order to understand how much it's nature or nurture. So, so that goes back to also testosterone, where the links between testosterone and aggress aggression are definitely there. Okay, they're solid across most relationships. You do see a correlation, but remember correlation is not causation, right? Testosterone does not make you punch somebody. It just doesn't. However, it does um, ignite like that flight or fight response. It does do other things to the body, to the processing that might lead to aggressive behavior. Now, the thing here, though, is that like consistent with that young male syndrome, most of the highest testosterone levels, that's when there also tends to be more aggressive behaviors, more crimes committed are from those late teens, young 20s kind of males. That is also the time where they have the highest testosterone, right? But they, that is also the time where there is more of a need for trying to find a, a person or let's just call it a mate for that biology kind of lingo. They're trying to kind of still have this social status and kind of finding a place for them in the world, right? So so a lot of those things are socially happening while also the testosterone is happening. Now the thing is that testosterone levels do change based on your social situations. They, base, they change based on your activity. For example, if we were all in class going to go and do something super competitive or very like physical laborious like let's say we're flipping tires a bunch or something and doing a competition we can literally see our testosterone level change because uh and that's both for women too so testosterone levels will increase and decrease depending on your activity level um and and it's also complex hormones so Knowing the role of human aggression and testosterone is going it is very complex. There's not just a direct link because again, there's so many other factors that impact testosterone. But if I were to ask you in the test, is there a correlation between testosterone and aggression? The answer is yes. It is weak, 
but it is positive and it is consistent and it is not equal causation. All right, and this just to end, one thing also to remind ourselves is that when we think about manhood and womanhood, just those cultural experiences that people have, definitely see manhood as being more precarious. So basically manhood is in a way kind of more easily lost than as a social status than womanhood. Um, and you can see this in our media, in our experiences at home, you know, just many ways. I come from a very traditional family and I know often, you know, I, when I was a kid, I would hear like, well, what are you, a girl? You know, and that that's kind of saying like you're, this, this action that you're doing here is, you know, questioning whether your manhood is, should be yours. Uh, that is, that's part of that culture. And women, although we do live in a patriarchal society, the expanse of how, how much it takes for you to lose your womanhood card, let's just call it, is a lot more uh, wide. So for example, um, you can see this in terms of drinks. Here I have a, a beer, I'll just call this beer here, and then we have like a fruity little strawberry daiquiri. Right? If you have women liking beer, it's cool. Like It's not necessarily something that people will then question necessarily their sexuality or how women they are. But for men, it's different. For men, uh, ordering the daiquiri can be seen as a feminine thing. And therefore, that is an example of how it can be kind of more precarious. It's a little more fragile. It's almost like they need to protect it a lot more so, uh, which is kind of weird when we think about, again, our society being patriarchal and yet it's fragile to kind of keep that role it's really interesting anyways that is it for today